Hey y'all, this is Chantel Ogden. We're backstage at the Grand Old Opry tonight talking with Mike Noble. And uh, I don't even know where to start. I told you as we were coming in, you've had so many successes in so many areas. Oh. I didn't even know what to start with, but I guess let's, let's talk a little bit about how you ended up in Nashville. Um, and I guess I'd really like to hear the Roy Orbison story. Okay. Well, that was a fluke, but I ended up in Nashville because um, after I got out of service in the early 70s, uh, everybody had left my hometown. There was nothing going on. And a couple of guys that I was in high school bands with had dropped out of college while I was gone, and they moved to Nashville to be songwriters. So I came to Nashville simply to visit old friends. And uh, I liked it here. I didn't have anything going on. I went back home and got my duffel bag and all my belongings, which fit in the back of my car. and. And I never left. And tell me about how the Roy Orbison connection came about. What it was was Steve Gibson, um, uh, who was a young guy that had dropped out of college as well. But he was already, he was so gifted, he was already in Nashville at 20 or 21 years old. He was already doing master sessions and plenty of demos sure. as a new guy. And so he had been working for Roy Orbison's people. Roy had a very vibrant, very living publishing company. Steve was plugged into some of that. And Roy uh, was about to do one of his rare dates. He wasn't doing many dates in this. This was an, a, a quell in his career. And he had a rock and roll revival show to do in Toronto, Canada. They asked Steve to do it. Steve couldn't do it. He said, call this guy that just moved here from Illinois. He'll do you a good job. And they did. And so um, I got to do the job because Steve couldn't do it. That's how. That's how I got it. And so. I did this date with Roy, and I didn't meet him until right before the gig. I had no idea. I'd never played a, uh, a con I'd never played a concert. I'd played plenty of gigs. This was a concert. There were a lot of people there. It was a big Maple Leaf Stadium, and uh, I was absolutely, once I looked out and saw how big the crowd was, I was mortified. Um, but anyway, I got through that night. I was supposed to hand Roy his guitar when he came on stage. I froze. Finally got him his guitar, looked out there, and you know, the next thing I know, I'm playing the licking pretty woop. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Having an out of body experience while I was doing it, because Roy was right where your cameraman is right, right now, and I was watching right. this charismatic singer with black hair and black glasses that, you know, I was watching him mesmerize right. a crowd, and I'd never seen that kind of thing before. Can you talk a little bit about. Um you know, those early days of being a songwriter and kind of what that materialized into? Well, uh, when I moved to Nashville in 73, um, actually through the cast of characters I I had known, I ended up working on the road, first with Dave Loggins, who had a big hit in the 70s called Please Come to Boston. Mm -hmm. I went out and toured with him for three years. That led to a gig with a lady named Lynn Anderson, who had a big hit called I Never Promised You a Rose Garden. I did that for five years, so what I knew was is that I could stay on the road and make a living, but I uh, also knew that if I didn't get off the road at some point in time, I'd never leave. I'd, sure. I'd be. So in 1980, um, after my last uh, the year wound up with Lynn, I decided that I was going to go ahead and pursue what I really wanted to do, which I wanted to write songs professionally, and I wanted to be a studio musician someday, you know, and you can't do that on the road, you know, you're just gone. So uh, I got off of her gig and I did some manual labor for uh, a number of months, nine months actually. But in the meantime, I discovered this little publishing company called House of Gold. And I used to go down there, hang out, make coffee. It was a very successful kind of a beehive of activity down there. All kinds of writers doing all kinds of stuff and a lot of them having success. And it was still kind of a family frat boy atmosphere. or. Um, uh, I shouldn't say frat boy because it wasn't just men. There were women having success as well, but it was kind of a loose atmosphere. And uh, I went down there every day that I wasn't working, I would be at House of Gold mm -hmm. in the kitchen with my guitar trying to hook up with people or trying to mm -hmm. make myself useful. They had an eight track recording studio upstairs. They had a lot of songwriters that didn't play very well and go like, hey man, I just finished something. I need a guy to, you know, come up and play some chords on my. I became that guy. I played for free for a ton of guys that were doing really well. And also, it gave me an opportunity to uh, begin to pitch my melodic ideas or my titles to people that were having success. Mm -hmm. And it was a very friendly, uh, it was a friendly, com competitive environment. But if you had a good idea and there was a, a writer there that wasn't 
particularly busy that morning, he'd work with you or she'd work with you. Mm -hmm. And I had a couple of ideas and I slowly over a number of months I kind of worked my way in and it led to me finally after a year of this uh, cleaning the kitchen and such, uh, getting my own deal with, with that company and I stayed with them until they were finally uh, they were acquired by Warner Brothers and then I wrote for Warner Brothers music from 84 to 2000.